I'm going to start off with some introductions, and, uh, but first I want to thank everybody for coming. This is the Evolving Natural Gas Economy, New Perspectives on a Domestic Resource. That is the title of this panel, so hopefully you're all in the right room. Um, it's been a great Energy Frontiers conference. I hope you all have been able to attend some of the other uh, events that we've had. Uh, Amory was a, had a magnificent speech. We had a very interesting panel this morning on uh, renewable energy and a uh, great poster session. So the fun continues. Uh, we've got a uh, career fair coming up uh, right after this panel. And uh, uh, we've got some great panelists, some real experts in the room to discuss this topic. I'm going to start with our moderator, Mark Safty. Uh, Mark is, uh, is my professor. I actually refer to him as Professor Safty, And he is a partner in the chair of Energy Infrastructure Group at Holland and Hart, LLP. For more than 25 years, he's he has represented companies operating on five continents. Uh, in virtually every type of in infrastructure development uh, and financing tra transaction. Extensive experience in energy and all sorts of other infrastructure projects. Uh, Mark was appointed as the Worth Chair in Sustainability at the University of Colorado in 2013. So he's going to be have the tall order of keeping this bunch in line, so we appreciate him. To his left is Rob Swanson. And uh, Rob is a founding partner of Denver-based technology operations and management consulting firm, Raz & Associates. Uh, Swanson's background includes leading engagements for upstream and midstream executives, including operational and technical strategies. Uh, during his 20-year career, Swanson has helped Denver-based companies achieve uh, growth and expansion in U.S. Uh, natural gas development. Uh, Swanson has been instrumental in launching initiatives such as Case for Colorado, working closely with Coloradans for Responsible Energy Development, and Western Energy Alliance. Thank you, Rob, for coming. To Rob's left is J.C. Wharton. Uh, uh, J.C., Mr. Wharton, as he's referred to, is, uh, is Managing Director at Stratcom Advisors, LLC, an energy a and consulting firm. Uh, pr previously, he was a member of the National Energy Practices uh, at PricewaterhouseCooper, Anderson, SunGuard, and PA Consulting. Uh, he brings over 35 years of experience in spanning all segments of the energy value chain from both a physical and financial perspective. Mr. Wharton is a registered commodity trading advisor, has held all major trading and principal licenses with the SEC and the CFTC, uh, while at Morgan Stanley and Prudential Securities. Um, he's presented over 150 conference forums in North America and Europe, guest lecture at 10 other universities, and is author of the award-winning book, Power Play, Who's in Control of, our energy, of the Energy Revolution. Um, unfortunately, he has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Oklahoma and, uh, and an MA from uh, Oklahoma City University. To his left is Craig McDonald. Uh, Mr. McDonald is the Managing Director at Navigant Consulting with more than 30 years of experience in utilities, private equity, energy service companies, uh, and government agencies on developing, implementing, and evaluating clean energy policies uh, and programs and emerging clean energy technologies. Uh, he has worked with more than 30 di uh, 50 different utilities, uh, both publicly and investor-owned, uh, on developing their energy efficiency and marketing programs. Uh, Mr. McDonald has worked with a number of energy service companies on developing and marketing uh, energy service products, uh, and he has uh, advised governmental agencies, utilities, uh, and investors on policies and investments uh, to accelerate the commercialization of emerging clean tech technologies. And to his left is uh, Th Thomas H. Stoner, Jr. Uh, Tom Stoner is an investor, author, and thought leader in the clean energy industry. His career has spanned from being the first acting director and founding board member of the Social Venture Network back in the 80s uh, to the author and publication of Small Change, Big Gains, a reflection of an en energy entrepreneur. Uh, we have a raffle going on right now, and you can win one of his books, so make sure you put your name in the, in the raffle hat. Uh, Mr. Stoner is a 30-year executive veteran of energy services and power industry, uh, having led two companies through venture uh, funding to successful exits, selling one to a publicly traded uh, utility holding company, and the second through an IPO uh, on the London AIM Exchange. Mr. Stoner was formerly the CEO of Evergreen Energy, uh, Econergy International, uh, and was also senior manager of the Clean Tech Fund of a Clean Tech fu the Clean Tech Fund from 2005 to 2008 one of the original clean, uh, clean technology funds in the emerging uh, clean, tech, clean tech industry. Over the last 30 years, Mr. Stoner has raved, raised more than $30 million in venture capital and public equity and invested proceeds into dozens of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Uh, he is a graduate of the Hampshire College uh, and the London School of Economics. He is currently a board member here at the University of Colorado's Clean Tech program. So uh, as I said, an uh, outstanding panel we have. Uh, going forward, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Mark Safty. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. 
Thanks, especially for teeing up such a great panel. This will be easy for me. Uh, I'll just um, turn it over to the real experts. Uh, I would, though, like to take two or three minutes and exercise the moderator's prerogative and just follow up on something that I heard this morning uh, and use it to maybe set a little bit of a tone for this panel discussion. Um, there was a panel. How many of you were at the panel discussion this morning about electric energy? Good. Um, you all heard the question at the end, and for those of you who weren't there, the question asked by Paul Komar, the panel moderator and a faculty member here at, at CU, was to the people in the audience, what, uh, or, or really speaking as a representative of the university, he asked the panelists, what would you like to have from the university? What can the university community do to support the dialogue around distributed versus centralized electric generation and the sort of groundbreaking trends that are occurring in that arena? And unfortunately, um, something was going on in my BlackBerry and I only heard um, part of the answers. But the answers were, were pretty good, but I kind of hit all around what I think the real answer to that question is. Um, those of you who are associated or involved in the university as faculty or students, my, uh, and, and I am, I'm a faculty member here at the, at the law school and also at the uh, School of Public Affairs at CU downtown in Denver. Um, but I, I think what the university can do for people in the industry and people who have economic and other interests and imperatives uh, in natural gas or electricity, uh, what the university can and should do is double down on being a committed source of clean, unbiased, balanced information on hypercritically thought through information and analysis that can be used to further the discussion around these very important issues. Advocacy is really important and all young students want to be advocates for some cause or another. And I think that's wonderful, but that should be secondary to the primary goal of convening around what the facts are because I'm here to tell you, there are lots of people in this room and out in the world who know more than I do about the issues we're gonna talk about in this panel discussion. But everything I know conflicts with everything else I think I know. And who, where you, as my grandmother used to say, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, well, if you're sitting down and reading something when you stand up, that's where you're gonna stand and then you're gonna move over and read something else and it's, and, and it's gonna change your mind. Um, unbiased, sound, critically thought through information available to all um, and hopefully information on which all sectors involved in the debate or in the dialogue can agree on. And, and you know, just, just a, a, a quick example of what I'm talking about here. Take this statement. Um, in the generation of electricity, natural gas emits half the carbon dioxide of coal. I don't think there are many scientists who disagree. I think they may want to refine what we mean by half. Um, but that's pretty much accepted as a true fact. Um, but when you peel back the layers and you go from one side to the other side, you'll find people suggesting with some degree of convincing um, probity, with some degree of persuasiveness, that if you compare the all-in cost in environmental terms, not even in environmental, if you compare the all-in emissions effect of producing and burning natural gas to generate power, today, the way it's being done, diesel fuel is a better deal, okay? Now, the experts who say that are looking at facts like in the Bakken formations in North Dakota last year, a third or slightly more than a third of the produced natural gas was not sold, it was vented or flared. And that is not without a climate change uh, impact, a huge impact. Okay. So what's the, what's the truth? And how do we take the truth and get to the real point? Another fact on the other side, uh, it is in fact true that burning natural gas is 50% more efficient from a CO2 emission standpoint than burning coal. But it's also true that in the state of the art gas turbines, which are now just beginning to roll out, if we replace the fleet of natural gas generation in this country with the state of the art generation equipment, it would be even 50% cleaner, okay? That is a tremendous argument in favor of natural gas. 
The existing fleet in the United States that uses gas to generate electricity operates on what we call a heat rate of 10,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. The new units produce electricity at 5,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. Okay, let's get the facts. So in that spirit, we're gonna get facts today from our panelists. And I'm gonna shut up. Um, and I think um, because consistency and symmetry is, are the hobgoblins of small minds and my mind is small, we're gonna start with Mr. Swanson and move to the left. We'll go right to left and then maybe we'll come back. So I'm gonna pose a question to these guys. We're going to talk about that question um, we're going to do that a couple of times, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. One request. I, I want to see if we can get a little more time for questions than less, because I think we'll have a lot of questions. You, they'll be passing, Pat, and you'll be passing around cards, right, for people to write questions. My only request is that when you write your question down, um, indicate in the upper right-hand corner of the card with a, with a letter S if you are a student, because I'd like to give a, a student or two the opportunity to have the first questions presented. Um, we are at an institution of higher learning after all. Um, so let's go on that. So here's my question, my first question to the panelists. I'd like you to comment, each of you, from your own specialty, from your own perspective, on this question. Two questions. Go big or go home, okay? What are the advantages of going big into gas in this country? in electricity generation, in, in fuels for transport, which we'll come back to in, a, in more detail in a little bit. What are the implications of going big? What are the um, back and forth issues that each of you can think of or address uh, that are associated with going big? Conversely, what are the downsides of going big? How might it be better if we just go home? If we just say, instead of expanding production and ever increasing production, um, we just said, look, um, let's kind of level it off where it is now. Let's depend on it to the extent we need it, but let's force our economy and our governments and our systems to adapt to the new world without it. Pros and cons of go big or go home. Um, Rob, you want to start with that? Yeah, I'll start. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so from my perspective, uh, as a management consultant that advises energy executives and is also trying to help educate the general public uh, on facts, and I couldn't agree more. I think universities uh, are, from a polling standpoint, one of the, if not the most trusted objective source of information. And what I look at from a business perspective is not always the art of the possible, but what is doable. Um, if I took the stance of let's go big, um, and I'll let these guys comment on kind of the other areas and, and functions of uh, the energy industry and geopolitical uh, things that are going on with energy. Um, there, there is going to be a massive, if you go big with natural gas, um, a, a major competitive and comparative advantage for the United States of America. Um, right now with the infrastructure that we're building out and our cost of energy from uh, kind of a residential or civilian standpoint, and then you look at manufacturing and other industries that need energy to produce goods. Um, the Boston Consulting Group uh, was published in a study today, I think, or yesterday, where we could have a five to 10% cost advantage compared to other nations, okay? That is significant. Um, it is significant in that it's not just their utility costs of, you know, these large companies that do that, but also from a, a production cost. Um, that gives us a huge advantage as a country to create a lot of jobs, um, a lot of other infrastructure, to also invest in other clean tech energies. Um, but it's not without its uh, issues as well. Um, I would agree. I, there are so many variables um, in this discussion that um, it's difficult to understand if we did go big that in 10 years from now other technologies um, that improve our efficiencies with fossil fuels, um, new clean tech energies that could improve production could get us uh, to a point where even 10 years ago we didn't, we didn't believe we would be here today. So if you, if you were to go big, I think there are a lot of pros. On the con side, um, there's a lot of issues with emissions. Um, 
bouncing the energy portfolio, uh, the, the, the cap and trade on, uh, uh, um, on, on pollutants is an issue where I don't have all the answers. And mentioning uh, this morning, it sounds like you talked about utility and natural gas as well. Um, as somebody that's a native of Colorado, I was out skiing in Silverton this weekend down in Durango, and we drove out I-70, and you see these gigantic wells out of nowhere. Um, I don't own that land. I don't, I don't, I'm not a neighbor to that land. But from an economic standpoint, there are a lot of pros and benefits to this. I'll let the other panelists speak to maybe the cons of going big versus small. JC? Uh, he brought up a very interesting fact there. On the price of natural gas now, uh, one of the things we were going to talk about is volatility of pricing. And when you talk about natural gas, it's not so much the price as it is the basis differential between various parts of the country because of the pipeline inefficiencies and in the transportation. But one of the things with the price of natural gas right now and the abundance of it from the shell uh, formations, the petrochemical industry along the Mississippi River, uh, the Houston Ship Channel is now the most competitive place in the world. No one can compete with us on petrochemicals because of the cheap gas and uh, the liquids extracted from it. Uh, another issue, when, when we're talking about environment, let's talk about the pipelines for a minute. Uh, Keystone Pipeline, a lot of debate about that, whether or not we build it. So how do we get crude out of the Bakken, the Powder River Basin, and other places? We ship it by rail. If you'll look over the last three months, about every two weeks in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, there was an article of a rail car train wreck carrying crude. In Ontario, uh, province in Canada, what, 47 people were killed from that rail car explosion carrying, carrying the crude. So, you know, if we can't build the pipelines, which are, are very antiquated in this country, the transcontinental pipeline uh, that takes gas, two twin 48-inch lines from the, the Gulf Coast to the New York City gate, those were built, I think, in 1948 very, very outdated. If we can't build new pipelines because of regulatory risk, uh, we started out with NIMBY, not in my backyard, and now we're pretty much at banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> We've got to be able to move the product, and if we can't build a pipeline, then we're gonna have tr rail, rail car wrecks. So that, the regulatory risk, and when we're talking about some of the issues there on fracking, one of the things about fracking that is very water intensive, and there is just a lot of competition for a drop of water between the agriculture, the energy, municipalities, a lot of issues out there to be addressed. Well, when I first saw this question, I was reminded of a line in an old folk song. It talks about the king asking his wife, uh, advisors to go and boil the world's wisdom down into one sentence. And after 10 years, his wise men came back and said, we have managed to boil the world's wisdom down to one sentence. And that sentence was, this too shall come to pass. <laughs> One of the advantages and there, uh, of having worked in energy consulting for 30 years is we've se I've seen, we have seen collectively several gas bubbles and we've seen them pop uh, several times. I want to remind you when we think about going big on gas that it's easy to forget that the past uh, the, the recent past unduly influences our view of the future. <coughs> and that happens in, in business investments and in public policy forums. So I like to try to keep on uh, uh, this point that uh, you raised, really, about volatility. Volatility hasn't just disappeared because we have a 50-year-old 
technology called fracking, which has now gotten much better than it was 50 mm. years ago. But the, you know, there are still some issues associated with it. So I think some of the uh, mandates and stampedes for going big on gas are unduly influenced by the current surplus in many production fields. That surplus was also exacerbated by the weak economy over the past five years. So we would not have seen so much pressure to build export terminals and uh, uh, producers worrying about the low natural gas prices in the fields if the economy had stayed at its high production. Now, one of the things we talk about is the energy competitiveness of the U.S. and how this natural gas really makes us so energy competitive. I have two things about this, and this is what I'm worried the most about on the natural gas. This time it's maybe bigger than a bubble, we'll call it a blimp. Uh, but is, uh, uh, is that it will endanger a, or engender another era of backsliding. So we saw fairly dramatic improvements in the energy efficiency of the U.S. economy in uh, uh, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Mr. Stoner was rolling out a couple of ESCOs at the time, taking advantage of those market forces. And we saw them all wither away in the 90s to virtually nothing. Now we see that industry coming back again. Are we going to lose all that progress that we're making on energy efficiency and renewables? Because, oh, now we got cheap, abundant gas again. And then in five years from now, we'll be in the same boat again. Um, you know, and I, I point out, I, I like the energy efficiency story partly because I've made a living at it for 30 years, uh, but partly because I, I was in, uh, in uh, London about three weeks ago, and you know, uh, the EU director of energy, I was talking with him, and he pointed out that you know, the er Europe used to be um, cost competitive with the United States on energy because they were 20% more efficient in production than the US. And so it didn't matter that energy was more expensive in Europe than in the United States. Over the past 20 year, 15 years, that efficiency gap in production has totally evaporated. So, the United, uh, so when we talk about the United States chemical industry is the least cost chemical industry in the world, part of that is because of the huge investments made into proving the te efficiencies and the technologies for that. So now we're, it, the industry is poised to take advantage of low energy prices. So uh, I think it's really important <coughs> to remember that these things are linked. And we, uh, you know, so uh, I want to go big on oil or natural gas. I don't want to see it imported or, or that being a reason to stampede to develop LNG and export it. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, geopolitical risks associated with it. Uh, we're still, in, even today, we import as much <laughs> gas or much oil as we use, so or as we produce domestically. So still, half of our uh, uh, ga uh, gas and liquids uh, consumption is imported. So there's why are we rushing to export it? Why are we rushing to undo the progress we made in the last 30 or uh, 15 years in uh, energy and renewables? Um, if you read most of your conventional presses today, um, or if you've read them over the last year, I don't care whether it's the Wall Street Journal or The Economist or even a foreign, you know, more serious magazine like Foreign Affairs, and you read the coverage on natural gas. Um, you almost get a pornography kind of outlook in terms of what natural gas is. You know, you'll get this characterization that natural gas is, is cheap. You'll get the idea that natural gas is a cleaner burning fuel source over, you know, oil or coal. That it's kind of like a, 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 a white horse to, to our energy or climate problem. Um, you, you'll get a, a third perspective that it's new, um, that it's this kind of new product of 
you know, recent innovation. And even recently, if you look at the press, the one additional argument I've been seeing is that <coughs> natural gas is a weapon. It, it, it could be used as a way to get Russia to kowtow to the U.S. policy positions, you know, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, if we would just export this natural gas to Europe, we would free Europe from being kowtowing to Russia in its sources. So you, you, th this is the kind of view that you're seeing in the, in, in the, in the press. And I'm going to get to my two recommendations here pretty quick, but I think I'm here to tell you that a lot of the things they say about natural gas are true, but it's oversold. It's clearly oversold. It's, it's not clean uh, for a lot of reasons that we talked about earlier. I mean, in terms of when you look at shale gas specifically, the methane associated with shale gas exploration and extraction pushes up that greenhouse gas to where it may be the most toxic of any of the greenhouse gas fuels. The, 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 it's, it's not new. They, they've been trying to develop shale or, or ex, uh, exploit shale deposits since the 1950s when they dropped a nuclear bomb into a shale deposit up in Rifle, Colorado in the 1950s. The, the oil companies have been after the shale gas for a, a, a heck of a long time. You know, um, it's, it's not, it, we don't know let, look, let me be clear. There is a lot of carbon underneath the crust of the earth. There's a, there is probably way too much of it if we want to try to burn it and stick it up in the atmosphere. But it doesn't make it cheap. And we, there's a lot of things we don't know yet about shale gas where it's being oversold in terms of the depletion rates, about how quickly some of these deposits, will it behave in the same way that drilling for conventional gas occurs when you drill for it, will, will, will it deplete more quickly? You know, whether natural gas can be used as a weapon against someplace like Russia, you know, that's a little bit above my pay grade. <laughs> but I, I have to, I, you know, I have to wonder why, the, why is this happening in the press? And, and I, I, I come back to um, a pretty clear view when I look at all of the energy resources and all of the opportunities and there's, real no, there's no real decision we have to make about natural gas if we could all make, wave our magic wand in here today because the capital markets do it for us. I mean, they deploy capital and they deploy it very easily and very quickly and they love natural gas because it's big, more centralized, easy to finance a large project over a small one. So the capital markets are doing just fine, you know, cutting checks to anybody that has a right to uh, uh, some carbon underneath the Earth's surface. So the recommendation that I have um, relates to if you were, if you did have a magic wand and you could wave world politics or national politics, you, you would really isolate down into a, 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 a tax on carbon emissions. And, and do that including natural gas. Get these natural gas companies that are exploiting these reserves to start tapping their methane releases and using them economically, but giving them an incentive to do so and an obligation to do so through a carbon tax. Then let the capital markets do what it does best, which is seeking out the lowest cost solutions. And secondly, and I'm going to challenge you in terms of the University of Colorado and what it should do. And I, you know, I, 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 you know, I really love the idea of academic neutrality and 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 trying to give you know unbiased information to the marketplace so we can all make appropriate judgments. But there's another element in terms of what I see as the potential here on the front range. You have you have some of the best intellectual property that exists anywhere in the world when it comes to energy generation. And that's because of what's here at the University of Colorado and a lot of its departments. It's because of the labs that we have here. <coughs> Exploit them. If you want to go big, go big and have University of Colorado not only try to provide information, but to engage industry in the commercialization of the intellectual property that exists. Do that. Go big that way and start cleaning up this environmental problem. Take on the issue of climate change. We may need to change some rules about how we behave 
and how we are as an academic institution, but there's a moral and economic imperative to do so. All right, we're rolling. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to um, take a second and uh, build a bridge to a bridge. You'll see what I mean in a minute. But I want to uh, re-inject one more editorial comment about critical thought and patience and analysis. Uh, how many of you have read a story or a couple of stories in the past few months or anything anywhere about shale gas development hydraulic fracturing potential in China? Have we seen anything? You've probably seen an article or two that said um, there are potentially massive reserves of uh, shale gas in China. You've probably seen an article or maybe two that say, uh, but we think that those formations in China geologically are far deeper and will be more expensive and difficult to get at than they are in the US. Okay? I'm telling you, people are discussing these issues. Policymakers are making decisions based on this information that's being distributed. And let me tell you what uh, a true story about hydraulic fracturing in China. In the United States, when you have drilled about 100 wells in a specific formation, shale gas formation, the geologists and the engineers begin, begin to get an idea of what's down there and how it looks and what, it's, what it might take to get it out. In 2012, by the end of 2012 in China, there had been 12 wells drilled in the entire country to figure out what the formations were. As of today, there have been 100 wells drilled in all of China to explore this resource. A lot more needs to be known before we can make judgments about policies, right? So, so that's just my editorial injection of more critical thought, please. Now to take it back to the bridge to the bridge, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit, have the panelists address this notion of natural gas as a bridge to the future. Um, and here's, here's my premise on this. I, I, um, I gave a presentation uh, twice at two different universities in Berlin in the month of November last year about the past, present, and future of renewable energy in the United States. They were all uh, masked and waiting to hear this and very interested in it. And I can't tell you how many people from the industrial sector, from academia, from business in Germany came to me and, and spoke to me about the competitive advantage issue. Comments went typically like this. There is no way that Germany will be able to compete with the United States in the next generation in terms of manufacturing, infrastructure, product, pr product uh, manufacturing and distribution. Because in Germany, 35% of our gas comes from Russia across Ukraine. You see an issue there. Uh, and in the United States, you have the lowest cost natural gas in great abundance in the world. Moreover, in Germany, uh, electricity costs 35 cents. Frank Prager from Excel on the panel this morning cited that number. He said it's 35 cents a kilowatt hour compared to about 10 cents here. That's not right. It's 35 euro cents per hour in Germany, which is more like 45 US cents. They, they're saying we can't compete industrially with the United States. But here's the bridge question. If we go big on natural gas and we disregard what's been talked about here as the efficiency gains and the other initiatives that we've been pursuing, if we go big and disregard those things, where do we end up in a generation when the Germans have fully absorbed and embedded all of the costs of a greener, cleaner, fossil fuel free economy? Do those lines cross? And do we become completely unable to compete? So let's talk about the bridge, the bridge of natural gas to the renewable future. What is that? What kind of bridge is that? Is it a long bridge, a short bridge? Is it a bridge to nowhere? Um, what, what, that, that goes over well in Boulder. Uh, what, what is it? Well, I, so this is, and I'm sure Tom and Craig and JC probably um, have some strong opinions on the, the technical aspects of it. but. <clears throat> Europe is definitely trying to, I think, reduce their carbon emissions by, is it 20 or 30, 40 percent by 2020 or so, 2030? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's fantastic. And the Europeans have a far different perspective on the environment and, and, and uh, um, natural resources and green technology. Okay? And that sounds amazing, right? That is all being challenged right now. Um, 
Europe is not doing well economically, okay? And so while there's this uh, uh, union of countries that wanna go off and do that, there's a lot of issues that need to be worked out there. <clears throat> One of the things that they're also battling is um, issues with demography, okay? So Europe, uh, I think in aggregate, is actually declining in population from average birth rate, right? So what's gonna happen is, you've got a, a cost disadvantage where it costs 3x in Germany for energy costs compared to, let's just say, the United States. And I think you're going to start to see some real challenges with, hey, we're going to go put in these higher cost, very green uh, technologies and capabilities and make investment, okay? Now, I, I, and I absolutely believe that, you know, the U.S. could have a lot to learn from Europe, but there are also very harsh realities of how are you going to take care of this aging population with a lower economic base, we can't sell our products, and my energy costs are three x com comparatively to the rest of the world. Okay, so from a bridge standpoint, all of a sudden natural gas sounds like a pretty good idea, um, and I don't know how Europe's going to solve its its issues with that. And I think I'm very excited to see how they they do resolve it. Um, if I look at the bridge in the U.S., I think one of the key things that I see um, is an issue of general education and awareness. Um, the fact that you all showed up here today, whether you're a student or not, means that you're interested, you care, um, you have a desire. Um, what's going on in the state of Colorado right now with potential fracking bans or moratoriums is a subject that is very personal to me. I mean, I get, we have energy clients, okay? But I also know this, I don't think a lot of people do their homework and research to really understand what the trade-offs are. Um, from a bridge standpoint, natural gas to me makes a heck of a lot of sense, okay? We've had a lot of things happen in this state where we've had solar, we've had wind, but Dennis, this made me think of a, I don't know if you all know Dennis Miller, the comedian and political sat satirist. Um, he did a stand-up special on HBO once and he got on the topic of energy and he said, we will quit uh, carbon fuels when we run out of them, okay? And I've never heard anyone put it that direct and that blunt, but are the people down the corner here are gonna go buy different cars, drive out of their way for um, uh, different gases, pay, pay higher prices for electricity, um, and, and I, I don't know. I, I know that I would certainly be willing to do that, but from a political leadership standpoint, the way, the way our leadership votes is often by the district and it's based on getting reelected. Okay, it is very, it's a very complex topic, but if you look at natural gas and the bridge, I don't think you're gonna get everyone to go big. It's just not gonna happen. But I think that if you, you have to invest in this while it is because it's a great solution right now. Um, it is, and I agree with Tom, it, it is the methane gas and the, and the leaks and the, uh, um, the new standards that are going in the state of Colorado with uh, um, uh, methane management are a great first step. It's got all the small EMP producers really hacked off because they don't think they, it's going to cost them more money than it does the bigger guys. But I think it is a perfect way to get our country going, to get the infrastructure and, and bridge. Because if you look at the technologies in uh, the internet world and Moore's Law, every 18 months mm -hmm. we double in technology evolution. I got to imagine that around the world we're going to improve on production of natural gas, green technologies and what have you, and I think this is going to be a piecemeal stepwise um, analysis that will only get better and more interesting, but right now I think it's a great bridge. Jesse? You know, I'm not an engineer, but I can tell you one thing. I think bridges cost money. Hmm. Let me ask the audience a question. What is the price? of an MCF, a natural gas. Can somebody tell me? Anybody? Shout it out. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry? 530. 530. Okay, 530. Okay, wh what, wh where, where does that price come from, 530? Is that a NYMEX price on? Okay. I, this morning on the NYMEX, the spot month for gas was 468. If you're a producer in the Powder River Basin 
up near Sheridan, Wyoming. At the wellhead, you're going to get $2.60, maybe, for that MCF of gas. The reference point that the world looks to, well, especially here in the U.S., is the NYMEX, the futures contract. If you're an XL customer, and I, I don't know, but I suspect you're probably paying 14, 15 bucks a decatherm MCF for that gas. So we're going from $2.60 at the wellhead to about 15 bucks at the utility. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, on the futures market, gas was trading around $5.25. At New York City gate, the physical price for, uh, for delivery there, if you did not have transportation, was 140 bucks an MCF. So the one thing I want to stress here is along the value chain from a producer in Wyoming getting $2.60 to what you're paying uh, your investor-owned utility for gas, there are some huge differentials. Along that value chain, there are a lot of, there's a lot of money made, and there's a lot of money lost. So one of the things I will tell you, all the considerations on all the issues, always look to the economics, and what one reference point on pricing is, is different all across that value stream. So that, that was the one thing I wanted to get out there when we're talking about economics and pricing. Oops. Okay. Um, I think from the earlier comments you heard that I, I like the idea of a bridge. I worry about the risks and the downside of bridge that we uh, uh, use it as an excuse for backsliding on our policies that are beginning to be very effective and have a fairly substantial impacts in both promoting energy efficiency and renewables. I worry about the rush to export gas is detracts from the bridge fuels. I wor uh, and um, I wor think that if we think of bridge, we should also think of where we use gas, where it, it can be switched out relatively sw soon. So when we start building a new building uh, that's going to last for 100 years, and we put in gas-fired boilers, are we really thinking bridge there? Um, so, you know, uh, or, or why don't we go <coughs> with the uh, variable refrigerant flow heat pumps which have outperformed in gas even if the electric plant is fired by gas? Maybe that would be the way to think of a bridge for heating that building. Um, so I, you know, I get tempted to say, well, the strategy, if we're really thinking of it as a bridge fuel, <laughs> is, is to really take care of that 50% of our energy consumption that is in transportation. Because the in transportation infrastructure turns over with a period of 10 years, whereas a lot of our manufacturing plants and our building stocks have 50 to 100 years. So I, I would really look at, hey, let, bridge is fine. But let's really talk about how long this bridge is and then what we do uh, to be consistent with that. One of the, and I will uh, kind of echo perhaps a way to ha really help that is with this carbon tax that has been floated. And now, of course, I know that's a non starter, but still, don't let the, uh, 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 you know, it, it's a, we need to kind of start thinking that way if we really are going to support the idea that. Uh, bridges and transitions. Mm -hmm. Tom? Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the world was in a race over the last hundred years um, and who won the, the, world, the war, so to speak, <laughs> uh, if you look at it from an energy perspective, was the country that managed to most efficiently take as much energy out of the ground and burn it. If you look at the next 100 years, the country that is going to win the war is going to be the country that figures out how to make the most out of what it has. We're in a different paradigm today. Efficiency across the board. I don't mean it in terms of demand side. I don't mean it just in terms of supply side. I mean it holistically in terms of taking every unit of energy that exists in every dollar 
and making it much more efficient. It's the only way to really make the, the climate issue, solve the climate issue fundamentally. Um, so, you know, the way that I look at it is, well, what, what do you need to do to make the capital markets more efficient so that they will use our energy resources more energy efficiently? And the fact is, is that our, our, our energy markets, they are very distorted. They're distorted through the use of subsidies going one way or going the other. And they're, they're implicit in everything. They start, for example, in our tax code. And there are incentives that exist for the exploitation of natural gas. A lot of these incentives were put together 20 or 30 years ago. It was the beginning of the natural gas bridge that we're already on. What do we need to do today? We need to get off the natural gas bridge and we need to get into the next phase and the shift to that may be in the tax code. So whether it's a tax on carbon or not, it certainly ought to be on creating parity with a lot of your other energy resources that make it the, a, a, a fair investment decision between energy efficiency, renewable energy, those kinds of technologies, and the exploitation of natural gas, which gets an undue advantage in our tax code just because it can be burned and transported, which you can't apply to renewable energy or energy efficiency or wind farms. But that kind of parity needs to start in our tax code and be what we're trying to bridge to the next uh, technology so that we can win the next war. Great comments, team. Um, let's start with some questions. Let's take, we have a question here from a student. And JC, if you'd take this one on first, uh, and then we'll, we'll spread it around if anybody else wants to comment. I think this is uh, very much up your alley because uh, part of the question deals with price volatility. Um, how does the recent price volatility, it's not recent, um, it's, it's endemic, uh, how, how does the, the recent price volatility and the outlook for natural gas exports uh, affect the outlook for uh, fuel use in, uh, for electricity and transportation? fuel use, the natural gas use for electricity and transportation, the volatility's impact on, on electricity and, and transportation use. Okay. Natural gas, back to NYMEX and back to commodities, natural gas historically since it started trading on the New York Mercantile Exchange on April 3rd, 1990 has been the most volatile commodity in the world. The only commodity that came close to that was when electricity traded, uh, and that was a more volatile. But on the implied volatilities, natural gas still remains one of the most volatile commodities in the world of any commodity traded. The recent shell discoveries in the gas production has flattened prices out over the last three years where we have not seen the volatility of pricing when you pick up the newspaper. So it, it has flattened out a little bit, but what I was asking a while ago is to get the point across, when you look at a gas price at one place, it does not mean that that's what the producer got at the wellhead, does not mean what the consumer pays. Uh, and then on the capital market side for investing in infrastructure, uh, I think the lower gas prices because of the, the the, plant, the abundance of supply has made that a very, very attractive uh, alternative now from the investment community, private equity and uh, public monies. On the transportation side, uh, I filled up someplace not too long ago and the natural gas pump was a buck 85, it was in Houston, it was a buck 85 for compressed natural gas and it was 350 for, you know, for a gallon of gasoline. So I, I, I think, I, I'm kind of with T. Boone Pickens there. I think that's just a matter of time. The economics are there. Another one, um, maybe Tom, you could start off with this one. It's right up your uh, bowling alley. Um, it's a tough question. How do we go about implementing a carbon emissions tax, politically and economically? A carbon emissions? A carbon emissions tax, both politically and economically. Um, 
You know, I do think that the debate around energy does need to change. Um, it, it, gets pol it gets polarized around dirty versus clean. And um, that changes real fast when you start talking about a carbon tax because the notion of it's just pay your freight. I mean, and I'm talking about taking a higher ground in the conversation where you're not a left wingy or a right wingy or whatever you might, you know, or what newspaper you read. Um, but you're taking the, a, a, a stance where if, if you're going to pollute, you got to pay for it. So pay at the well, you know, if, you, if, if somebody's getting a price at the wellhead, for natural gas, they ought to be responsible for the full, what it's called in, in economics is the fate and transport of the associated cost, and they ought to pay for it. <coughs> if they do that, then you let the capital markets run it out. Let them choose the technologies. Don't sit there in, in a kind of a, a Soviet system or a European system or, or even a Chinese system where you're trying to choose one technology over another. Let the market do it. Let the market run with it. And take that as your fundamental stance relative to the carbon tax. I do think at the same time, though, the taxes are challenging. There's a lot of people that are going for uh, uh, what they call a carbon neutral tax, where you're not just adding more revenues to the government troffers, you know, to go spend on whatever they want to. Um, uh, and and there's, that's getting some, some gr a groundswell. But the, the MLP, the, what is called the Master Limited Partnership Parity Act, is a real quick place to go because you're really arguing that your, your competing technologies ought to get the same shakes as natural gas or as oil um, uh, type technologies. And, and there, there is Republican support for that, Democratic support for that. It, it's just that the politics are such that you can't get anybody in Washington to agree to anything. But once they do, <coughs> they'll probably pass up something like the Parity Act. And they ought to, and there's really no dividing line between the Republicans and the Democrats on the issue. Uh, maybe we can have, uh, Craig, you start off with this one because your firm is a worldwide consulting firm. Um, question is, many other countries with natural gas reserves are following actions in the U.S. Could you comment on our responsibility as a global pioneer with respect to greenhouse gas and co-emitted species emissions and what it means from a climate perspective. That's a really big and really good question, but um, maybe just thoughts on what our responsibility and role is. Are we a global leader? If we are, how do we behave in this field? That's a, I always hate that expression. It's a great question, but it is a great question because <laughs> it's not one where I really thought about sure about. I, it, definitely, we are a global leader on the technology side. The world is rapidly trying to copy and adopt our technologies, and the companies that are doing it in the United States are rapidly looking into new markets. We're already seeing fairly substantial investments in the fracking type of productions in the North Sea, in the Ukraine, in Poland, um, and you know, and there's great potentials in several other basins, perhaps not fully explored yet, but there's no reason not to expect that there aren't comparable resources widely distributed around the world. I think it is paramount for our companies to be good stewards and emphasize best practices on an environmental point of view. Uh, you know, I think the companies generally have up their game a lot in the past decade in this area. There's still a lot of room to be gone, uh, uh, a lot of room to improve on that. But I think, for example, the uh, Colorado new rules on uh, uh, fracking practices will turn to be a benchmark that will be adopted by lots of other uh, areas around the world. Uh, so I think, you know, again, I encourage some of those kinds of that quick adoption of best practices. Nice. I, I agree. Um, Rob, finally, what will probably be the last question we have, and by the way, I just want to uh, remark to the panelists and to all of you, 
those three very thoughtful questions all came from students. Have we got a glorious future ahead of us or what, <laughs> right? You're asking the right questions. Um, Rob, maybe you could um, wrap up the questions with this one. This is a tough one because it kind of is, uh, is, is really a, a big, broad question. But the question is, how do you address the problem of declining energy return on investment for natural gas production? It's a wasting, by its nature, you're using it up. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Oh, man, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think from building off of what Tom said earlier, it's, you know, we probably are on the bridge, and it's going to be a series of bridges as new bridges are defined and created. Um, you know, on the, on the decline of it, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have an answer that I'd really like, I would want to put forth on it. The, when, when we talk about what we can do with that resource and the cost, and apply it to trucking and um, industry and capturing it as, as, as much of it as we can in a more effective and efficient way, um, the, the incremental cost of you know, retrograding engines and, and uh, um, I was reading an article, I think a week or two ago on truckers that pay 120 grand for a semi truck and I don't know the, the life of a trucker, but, you know, in business school, they taught me, like, it's all about logistics. Things have to go from here to there, and trucks are the way most things get to places. And uh, it costs truckers, I think, $40,000 to approximately to retrofit their, and it might be $20,000 on a new semi to go and put in a, uh, a, a different burning, uh, you know, kind of combustion system. Um, the payback period is allegedly two to three years. Um, so as far as getting the nodes out and the, the efficiency of leveraging um, what the energy is, you know, I, I'd probably yield to these guys on um, some more technicalities of the, the, the resource itself. And JC, you might have thoughts on that. One of the things on pricing volatility, I would say always look to the corporate earnings and what happens there and how the analyst and the shareholders react to corporate earnings in the face of pricing volatility. So that's one of the benchmarks that all the CEOs, CFOs of the world have to live with daily. And I think, you know, one thing, and, you know, I hope I'm, I don't know what you guys are perceptually thinking about what I do and, you know, if you have drills next to your land and you're, you're here because you're wanting to learn about it and you're, you're mad. But I think the one thing that as our firm has really explored what's going on is get as much information as possible. And in my description of, you know, my experience and who I am, you know, we are working with the Western Energy Alliance, which is a collection of energy companies. And I think the, there's, there's kind of two things that really fuel why this is such a heated thing. This has almost become like religion. Mm -hmm. um, and the second you label it, right, and not look at it objectively, everyone, you know, it, it parts the seas very quickly. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like just not looking at corporate earnings, but the environment and what have you is a very difficult thing to, to assess all those variables. I think CU and, and, and other schools have a great opportunity to educate because I think the general public isn't necessarily well educated on the technicalities of this, the cost, um, the, the, the transportation effects, the, the what it actually takes to get something out of the earth. And so when you flip your light on, it's like magic. And the, the ease of that has kind of like gone away, right? Like there's, 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 there seems to be little recognition of the challenge of doing that, and we do it well. Um, no matter what energy resource we, you know, the portfolio of things that we look at, there's going to be cons, period. And so getting that information of what you're comfortable with and then having, and then forming your, the basis of your opinion off all that information, I think is, is really good. And be objective uh, and with a sensitivity on what paper you're reading which movie you saw, right? Things are so polarizing. On one instance, you can look at the lobbies for oil and gas and go like, I mean, how many people believe the energy companies on that fracking's good and, and, and you should trust us? Just a raise of the hands. 
<laughs> okay. Interesting. Let me ask you another question. How many of you believe all the environmentalists that we're all going to, you know, burn and, and, every, and the energy companies are completely evil? So there you go. <laughs> right? We got. It. We got. It. All right. So you two need to meet. You might. Pre <laughs> Maybe a good couple. Uh, I, I think. Okay. So the the more the, this is a very polarizing topic and. You know, our firm is trying to help educate, and we have an event where we're going to put DU, CU, CSU, and Mines in a room down in the Weston Hotel in downtown Denver, and the students, the undergrads, are going to pitch what they think the best solution is for the state, okay? And we're going to have the former governors be the panel. I, the, even generationally, when we look at polling data and talk to people, like, it gets very human, right? Like, and at cocktail parties, no one wants to be like, you don't trust fracking? And then someone's gonna go like, oh, you wanna kill Mother Earth? <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, it gets that way. And I, you know, as a business leader, you know, I've had energy executives say like, this is a tough thing for us to, to determine, but engineers are steadfast. They believe they're doing the right things. I don't think the energy companies themselves, there's no way that these are evil people trying to crush the environment. There are so many safeguards and policies and oversights. These guys are doing, these ladies, these men and women are doing the best that they can. Um, and I, I'm not smart enough to like put all these variables, run in a regression analysis and go, that's what we ought to do. So I would just encourage you all to get the facts <laughs> and seriously question every single source of information that you have and form your own opinion. And I think it's interesting to see the undergrads and, and other generations uh, challenge all the information and, and then go forward with your opinion. And on that note, let me, if I can, wrap this up with maybe a fun thought to leave you with or a fun <coughs> thought for how to think about some of these things. Um, I'm going to ask you a simple question, right? If somebody wants to answer it, raise your hand. If not, I'll call on someone. Question that you've been asked a million times, and it has a very simple answer. Question is, paper or plastic? <laughs> Any volunteers? Not you. Uh, Carrie? Neither. No, you see, neither <laughs> is the right answer. But I'm not looking for the right answer here. You forgot your bags at home, your cloth bags. You have two choices, paper or plastic. How about the woman right in front of Carrie there? Paper or plastic? Emergency backup bag. <laughs> paper is biodegradable. No, I just want you to answer the question. Which you are a consumer, you're standing there, some, some pimply 17-year-old kid is, <laughs> is looking at you and saying, I want to know your choice. <laughs> and he's going to judge you based on your choice. What is your choice? Paper. Why? It's not a crazy answer. <laughs> I've, also, I've also had answers when I asked this question, plastic, because I needed to pick up the dog poop. But, but why would you pick paper other than that your rabbit likes it? It's, it's, going, to, it's going to go back to the environment. Yeah, it's biodegradable, but it's also recyclable, right? True. So how many times can you recycle a paper bag? Huh. Seven, six, somewhere in that range. Good answer. How many times can you recycle a plastic bag? More. 700, 7,000, 700,000? Oh. As many times as you want. The question is not paper or plastic. The question is, what are you going to do with the goddamn bag when you get it home? <laughs> if you're going to throw it away, take paper. If you're going to recycle it, take plastic. OK? Huh. Huh. Peel back the layers. Think critically, understand, and make choices, and you'll drive policy. It's that simple. I'd like to really thank these gentlemen for their incredible contributions today. Thank you. And, and thank Patton and the CU Energy Club for this. Um, go Energy Club, go Buffs. I like that. Thank you again. Professor Safety for moderating this panel. It was, it was wonderful. I hope you all learned something. Uh,